Esteemed attendees, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope you had a very pleasant coffee break. Now let us proceed with the final session of the 13th Asia-Pacific ADR Conference titled ISDS on Asia Model. Well, in session four, the Honorable Madam Anna Jubang Bwet, Secretary of UNCITRO, and the Honorable Professor Hitek Shin, Independent Arbitrator at 20SX, will serve as our co moderators. And for our final session, we are joined by exceptional speakers, including Madam Aurelia Antonietti, Senior Legal Advisor at Exceed, and Mr. Arn Fuke, Partner at Ashurst and Mr. David Kim, partner at Baker McKinsey and KL Partners JV, and Madam Yoshimi Ohara, partner at Nagas Nagashima Ono and Sunemachu. And finally, Mr. Junyeol Alex Yang, prosecutor at the Ministry of Justice of Korea. So ladies and gentlemen, um, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce the distinguished co-moderators of our final session, Madam Anna Jubang Brett and Professor Hitek Shin. As I pass the microphone to them, please welcome them with a warm round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a great privilege and honor for me to moderate this session alongside my esteemed colleague and friend, Anna Juvimbre, on the theme of ISDS, an Asian model. This session will focus on two pivotal aspects of ISDS reform within the Asian context, transparency and third party funding. We will reflect on current developments at Oncetral Working Group 3 and ICSID and consider whether there are unique factors influencing adoption and practice in this area in Asian jurisdictions. I am particularly delighted to introduce our distinguished panelists, each of whom brings very valuable experience and insight to this conversation. Uh, in addition to what our uh, the the MC uh, introduced, uh, I will briefly add up some, uh, some of their experience. Uh, Aurelia uh, is a team leader and senior legal advisor at ICSID. Uh, she traveled all the way from Washington, D.C. Uh, to share her experience and expertise on these issues. Mr. Yang, uh, who is responsible for the defense of ISDS claims against Korea. So from Korean government perspective, he is a very important person. And <laughs> Yoshimi Ohara uh, is a Japanese lawyer, uh, one of the most uh, famous and reputable a Japanese lawyer who represented a Japanese client in the first investment arbitration case filed by a Japanese company. Arne Fox, partner of Ashurst, uh, he has represented clients in many ISDS cases. And David Kim, who represented a number of foreign clients in ISDS cases against Korean government, <laughs> together with Pom Soo Kim, who could not join us today due to unexpected business tri trip. Before we delve into uh, our two focus areas, I would like to invite Anna to provide an update on ISDS reform at Oncitral Working Group 3 and to share her thoughts on what future developments would be. We, are we have been privileged to have her annual progress report at this Seoul ADR conference over the years. Please join me in giving Anna a warm welcome. Thank you very much, dear Hitek, 
dear friend and dear partner in crime, because we are um, bringing together the last panel of the day, so I hope we will manage to be as uh, entertaining and interesting as the previous panels of this uh, very, very interesting and challenging uh, conference today. Um, thank you also for allowing me, uh, even as a moderator, a few words uh, to update you all on where we are in Ancitral with regards to the ISDS reform. As uh, Prof. Shin says, we had uh, this, uh, it has become a, a, a feature now in the uh, uh, ADR festival in Seoul to update you on the latest, uh, latest, latest produced by Working Group 3. Uh, we had uh, very early on the, uh, um, the, the, great, the great ideas, the great uh, scheme of things, and now we are in the actual unrolling and the actual uh, finalization of the different reform elements that have been uh, developed and deliberated upon over the years. So, uh, very quickly, uh, in terms of update, what has already been adopted and what, what is in the pipeline and what is still uh, to be finalized. So, already adopted last year, the Commission adopted the three first elements of reform, and you have to think about this reform as different elements that states will be able to choose, pick and choose from, and then um, uh, these elements will be brought together and will be part of the broader reform that will be de delivered through a multilateral framework convention. This framework convention will both be the way, the, the place where all the reform elements fit together so that it's a coherent reform, but also will be the mechanism by which the existing 2,000-some treaties will be updated as a result of the reform. So each of the reform elements that are being developed and adopted that will become operational through the Multilateral Framework Convention are meant to update existing treaties that the states will um, will offer, will, will um, include into the uh, multilateral reform convention, and by doing so, they will update them. Okay, so two different um, functions for this multilateral framework convention to be the place where all these reform elements fit and work together, and where all the members uh, joining the reform will be uh, parties, and the other one, the, the reform mechanism of the actual treaties, the way the treaties are being amended. Um, so last year, as I said, we started out with the code of conduct uh, that we worked on together with our friends and colleagues of ICSID. We developed a code of, and when I say we, I mean the working group and the commission. Uh, we, we only provide to the background, uh, and it's the member states that uh, negotiate and, and adopt. Um, but still, we have a sense of ownership. So we have developed a code of conduct for arbitrators and a code of conduct for judges that will be the members of the standing um, court for investment disputes that is being prepared and finalized as, as we speak. So, code of conduct, uh, some provisions on mediation in order to include into existing treaties where mediation is not part of the choices for investors, the mediation provisions so that investors and states can choose from the mediation options, and um, guidelines on investor-to-state mediation because we've heard a lot about mediation so far, but it's still fairly marginal in, as a means of settling investment disputes. So this is what was adopted last year. This year, the Commission adopted, in principle, um, an advisory center for investor-to-state dispute settlement with a, with a view to assisting and representing and training uh, developing countries and least developed countries as a priority in investor-state dispute settlement. Uh, akin, if you will, for those of you who are aware of the uh, advisory center that is attached 
to the World Trade uh, Organization, the ACWL, and with a view of really leveling the playing field uh, in the sense that most of the countries that are involved and that are targeted by this advisory center are states with very little means, very little experience, and uh, that are mostly uh, taken quite um, aback by these uh, investment disputes. Um, this adoption is an adoption in principle. Why? Because there are three key elements that are still missing in this uh, protocol to, um, on the advisory center. First, where the advisory center will be located. And um, we're not so surprised, but still we have seven countries that have so far um, um, offered to host the advisory center. So we are confronted now to a very difficult choice of the location of the headquarters and also the regional offices of the center. Second, uh, how the countries will be categorized, who's going to pay what and be eligible to what services. And number three, who, um, uh, how is this center going to be linked to the UN system? Are there merits in keeping it under the UN umbrella? Obviously, for least developed countries, it's going to make it easier for them to become, to use the services if it's part of the UN system. But on the other hand, the UN is, and how, even as much as I love my, my home institution, is a big bureaucracy. So, you know, having a, a center which is uh, operating on a almost private practice basis, uh, being part of the UN comes with challenges. So all of this needs to be finalized, and we are in the process now of the operationalization of these uh, reform elements. So this is what is already there, and there are a number of uh, core uh, reform elements that are still being contemplated, um, and um, let me uh, enumerate them. We have a, um, a proposal that was made very early on to establish an international investment court, a first instance and appellate uh, court that would be uh, the one hearing the disputes arising under the treaties that the states wanting to join the, the court would uh, include under this uh, protocol establishing the court. So that is one of the uh, elements of reform which is quite advanced because we have a statute uh, which is almost ready and the idea is that it will be presented to the commission for, and I'm looking at Jay, uh, for confirmation, uh, that is being presented to the commission in 2025 for its adoption. A second proposal that is on the table and it's also linked to the first one is to develop a standalone appellate mechanism that could be used for as a, as a second tier for arbitral awards rendered under ICSID or ANSITRAL rules. And the idea, as you can imagine, is not to develop a second tier investment court and a separate um, appellate mechanism, but rather to have one mechanism that bridges both the court, first instance, and the uh, investment arbitration, uh, also first instance. So this is also well advanced. We had uh, recently um, an, an event in China where this um, uh, reform element was really looked into in depth. Uh, I'm saying China because China is the main proponent of this uh, appellate mechanism, as the EU, in order not to name it, is the main proponent of the uh, investment court. Uh, and the last um, element of reform that is being developed is also quite advanced, is the one on um, procedural rules. And here, to very briefly um, explain where we are at, we're going to have a first batch of procedural rules that will more or less mirror uh, what ICSID has done in its amendments. The idea is to be as coherent and consistent as possible and not to develop some reform under ANSITRAL and other under ICSID. So we're going to take all these ICSID amendments on board in the broader reform uh, in, under the ANSITRAL uh, uh, Working Group 3 um, proceedings and uh, to also develop um, 
a set of procedural rules that will go a little bit further, and here it's interesting because we're going to be talking about precisely one of these uh, procedural rules, which is third-party funding, where our member states want to go slightly further than what ICSID has already uh, um, included, introduced in its amendments. And a third batch, which are the ones that we call in our jargon cross-cutting issues that are in fact issues that apply, that are a little bit, if you will, a borderline to the procedure itself, such as the um, uh, assessment and calculation of damages, which is a, 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 a reform element that is very much called for by developing and least developed countries. And of course, last but not least, the most important uh, um, still pending discussion is the one about this uh, multilateral framework convention, the way the convention is going to uh, allow the states to opt in their treaties for reform and also how uh, the, the parties uh, of this convention are going to keep, uh, the con to, keep um, to, to be the guardians of the convention but also of the possibility for further developments, further negotiations. The idea is not that we say, uh, okay, as of um, 2026, everything uh, in ISDS is final and finally uh, working perfectly and clockwork, but rather that we have a mechanism that allows to revisit um, on a regular basis to see if uh, it's necessary to adapt. So this is what I wanted to say um, to briefly update you. So you can see from last year, uh, we've added reform elements. There are three more to come. And after that, the uh, final delivery mechanism with the uh, ISDS uh, reform, multilateral ISDS reform convention. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for the very informative update. And the reform journey, as we all know, which began in 2017, has made notable strides thanks to the commitment and resilience of Anna, her team, and all those involved in Working Group 3. Their dedication to building consensus has been vital to the progress achieved thus far. And then we will uh, discuss the first issue of transparency. And I pass the mic to Anna for moderation. Back to me. Thank you very much. And here I'm going to be very brief in the introduction because we really want to hear from our panelists and not so much from us moderators. Uh, yes, we have selected transparency as one of the two themes uh, through which we will um, address ISDS in this uh, conference. The first theme is transparency. Uh, why have we selected transparency? Uh, for many reasons. First of all, because uh, we in Ancetral are celebrating the 10th anniversary of our transparency convention, of the Mauritius Convention that uh, um, brings transparency into ISDS proceedings. Um, we have also selected it because it's, it's because of the, the work that Ancetral has been doing on transparency that we were found or considered to be a credible forum to discuss and to develop reform of ISDS. It could have been done in a lot of other places, uh, but it was done in Ancitral because Ancitral had successfully uh, introduced a new element into existing investment treaties through the Mauritius Convention and uh, had also provided for a forum for consensus building around a difficult and quite divisive topic, which is to bring more transparency into, into investor-to-state dispute settlement cases. So um, Hitek has asked me to update you briefly on where we stand uh, with the Mauritius Convention. Contrary to my dear Singapore Convention, which sells like hot buns, we have new uh, member states uh, every six months in the Singapore Convention. It's not really the case in the Mauritius Convention. And we can see that a number of countries are still 
in a wait and see in a sort of an expectation uh, um, position vis-a-vis -vis the Mauritius Convention, which can be explained for many reasons. One of them, uh, not surprisingly, being the reform of ISDS, and countries are uh, generally now waiting to see what comes out of the reform of ISDS in order to adopt everything as a package. That is something we're hearing now more and more from states. And also, uh, while we have seen uh, many developments in uh, ISDS uh, towards uh, more um, openness uh, to, uh, for example, there is the more and more cases that include uh, amicus curiae, uh, we, s we will hear, I imagine, from uh, our panelists here that uh, there is still some reluctance on the part of parties to really embark on full transparency in ISDS proceedings. Uh, one of the highlights, though, to be not on a too negative uh, uh, position, is that the European Union has become a member of the uh, Mauritius Convention this summer. They have signed on paving the way for ratification by the EU states that had already signed on but could not yet ratify, and also for those countries that were uh, from the EU that were waiting to see what the EU would decide before they could also sign on to the Mauritius Convention. So hopefully um, it's going to be a, a batch of 27 plus countries coming our way in the Mauritius Convention in the coming uh, months or years. It always takes time for states to uh, enact and to uh, adopt and to uh, join. So I think it's also something we have to factor in. So, um, with this uh, very short presentation, this snapshot on where we stand in Ancetral and where the Mauritius Convention is uh, at with, uh, after 10 years, I think we would be remiss if we didn't go to the, the roots or the, first, the very first attempts at bringing um, transparency into ISDS. And these steps were undertaken by our friends and colleagues from ICSID. Um, many years ago. So I would be very glad to hear from Aurelia uh, what is the experience in ICSID uh, with transparency and where Asian states are with uh, regards to transparency. Over to you, Aurelia. Thank you, Anna, and I want to thank the organizer of this conference. It's a real uh, honor for ICSID to be part of this panel today and to attend the Seoul Arbitration Week. So, as a preface, as you know, we proceeded to amendments from 2016 to 2022, and with rules uh, that came into force on July 1st, 2022. So when we speak of implementation of the 2022 rules, so far we are still in the infancy, because July 2022, it took four months or five months for a case to come in. By now, you are maybe two years later, 18 months later, so we don't have had a hearing on the merits yet, we don't have any awards yet. Uh, we, we are past bifurcation for a lot of cases, past document production, maybe getting to jurisdiction, uh, but we don't necessarily have uh, all the perspective yet uh, that we will obviously have in, in three or four years when some cases will be concluded. So, um, so far in, so in September, uh, we had 84 cases under the 2022 rules. Um, and uh, today I'm going to first speak of transparency, then I will move on to TPF later. So on transparency, I'm going to focus on the main point of the 2022 rules. Uh, we already started the movements towards more transparency in the 2006 rules. Um, and what is important to realize is actually the parties are actually discussing the level and the extent of transparency, usually during the first session. Uh, and after the first session, we have a procedural order number one, which is like a terms of reference. But by now, we introduce a procedural order two on transparency issues. So the parties can modify the rules and can decide on total confidentiality if they want to. So what I'm going to, to comment now on are actually the default rules, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, right? The main changes are about awards and decision on annulment. 
So, the exit convention in Article 48.5, and that's very important, provides that the awards are published with consent of the parties. So, of course, we continue this practice. Consent is key. But we introduce a new rule, which says that if neither party objects within 60 days after the dispatch of the award or the decision and annulment, their consent to publication is deemed to have been given. And this concept of deemed to have been given is new, Obviously, we haven't implemented it yet. If there is an objection or no consent of the parties, uh, ICSID will extract the legal reasoning as we currently do. So that's the same practice. So that's for awards and decision and annulment to be distinguished from orders and decisions. There is nothing in the convention on order and decisions. So under the new rules, and unless a party agree otherwise, all order and decisions will be published um, and this will include redactions agreed by the parties, and the tribunal will decide any disputed redactions. So that's quite an important step. Also, the awards under the additional facility mechanism follow the regime of the order and decisions. So unless the party agree otherwise, all the AF, so the additional facility awards, uh, will be published or published with redactions um, by the parties or redaction of the tribunal. And if you look at our website, you may have noticed that we have way more procedural order one and two published, and that's part of this article, uh, this arbitration rule, excuse me, uh, where we, we have way more uh, orders and decisions published. We also have open hearings, but I don't think I have the time to go through that. Just want to mention that open hearings doesn't mean that we open the doors of the hearing room. Uh, we actually broadcast in a separate room uh, or online with some delays to protect confidential information. So that's very important to realize too. We also have new, I mean, more details rules on non-disputing party, NDP, and a new rule on non-disputing treaty party, so one of the contracting states to the treaty, um, which is the basis of the consent of, for the arbitration. Um, but let me go maybe now to the, actually the Asian experience. So first, Asia, uh, for us, you know, we are part, we are one of the five organizations of the World Bank, so we follow the World Bank geographical criteria for our statistics, and that's very important because we go from Mongolia to Southeast Asia to Pacific, uh, but for example, Central Asia is not in Asia for us because Central Asia is with Eastern Europe. So anyhow, I will say Asia in short. Uh, we have had 68 cases, arbitration cases with Asian states. Most are governed by the 2006 rules. We only have two rules currently, two arbitrations, sorry, under the 2022 rules, um, one with Vietnam and one with the Philippines. So over the 68 cases we have had, uh, 55 are concluded, and there were 31 awards rendered. Out of those 31 awards rendered, 21 are actually public. So that's a 74% of the award published, which is a pretty good uh, ratio for us. Uh, 21 awards public, two excerpts, excerpted but also public on our website. Eight awards that are not public and have no excerpts. Uh, so under the, under the 2006 rules party could object or could decide up front that there will absolutely be no publication of the award. Um, we have 13 cases currently pending, and I must say that we try to find a trend, and there is no trend. Some states are fully on full confidentiality, uh, while others, like for example the Lao People's Democratic Republic, um, is more for publication. Also, China, we have one case with China where the documents are published, uh, so, but we couldn't find a trend. And I'm going to leave you with a provo provocate, provoking thought which are that some states that are advocating transparency in the working group, for example, are not quite opting for full transparency in cases. Um, so my personal answer to that is just practice may be different from the principle, but also that the people negotiating the treaties are not the same people that are actually litigating the cases. Uh, so when it comes to actually doing the cases, maybe states are actually more hesitant, uh, at least at the beginning of the case, to actually accept full transparency, but we, you know, we had a good rate of publication of awards, I must say. Thank you very much, Aurelia. Yes, the uh, the, 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 the 
the sheer numbers you are putting uh, forward are, are impressive. I, I would not have bet on 70% uh, of the cases from the region published. So congratulations, because it's also a lot uh, of your efforts as the institution to bring about uh, a level of comfort uh, with the parties to, to, to make their cases um, available to the public. Um, now I'm going to move to another one of our panelists, and I'm going to do that maybe uh, with uh, some, uh, some velvet gloves, because I really don't want to put you on the spot. I know how difficult it is as a government lawyer, uh, especially when you have some uh, uh, ministers and vice ministers in the room listening in to you, uh, to explain what is the policy of your country with regards um, your experience in Korea, but also your policy with regards transparency and investment arbitration. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Aurelia. Can you start the slides? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to present today here at the Seoul ADR Festival. Today, I'll share Korea's experience with transparency in ISDS under the Corus FTA, along with some potential concerns related to the Mauritius Convention on Transparency. Please note that my views today are personal and not the official position of the Korean government. As I already said before, I think the revised exit convention regarding transparency is very similar to the current FDA transparency regulations. Let's start the overview of transparency. Now, transparency refers to making arbitration proceedings publicly accessible. It enhances ISD's legitimacy and predictability. However, in my experience, many investors still prefer confidentiality, especially in cases under pre-2013 UNCITRAR transparency cases, where confidentiality remains a key principle. Uh, I'm sorry, but there is an error on this slide. This 2000, not pre-2014, but pre-2013. Let me correct that. Let's see Korea's experience under Korus FTA. Article 11.21 of the Korus FTA sets clear transparency obligations requiring the public disclosure of important arbitration documents like notice of arbitration, pleadings, submissions, and awards. Hearings are also open to public with exceptions for protected information which is designated by the parties. Let's see the real Coros FTA article 11.21. As shown on this slide, I'm not sure if you can read these articles because the words are so small, it, but if you read that article, article 11.21 outlines transparency obligations by mandating the disclosure of various documents. Uh, if you see the A, item A, the notice of intent, and B, the notice of arbitrations, and C, pleadings, memorials, and briefs submitted to the tribunal by a disputing party, and any written submissions submitted person to article blah, blah, and D, minutes or transcripts of hearings of the tribunal where available, and E, orders, awards, and decisions of the tribunal. Also, uh, if you see the number two, the tribunal shall conduct hearings open to the public and shall determine blah, blah. Uh, it, this regulation is very similar to the revised exceed transparency rule uh, as Aurelia said. Yeah. Next, we will examine the real case which is conducted under Kuros FTA. The case name is Mason versus Korea. Uh, as you can see, uh, this slide is showing the PCA website uh, regarding the Mason versus K Korea. In this Mason case, procedure orders in line with Kuros FTA Article 11.21 mandated the public disclosure of pleadings, sharing transcripts, procedure orders, and the award, all made available on the PCA website. If you can see the slide, you can see documents, uh, the notice of arbitration, and written submissions, memorials, and uh, counter memorials, and so on. However, redactions protected commercially sensitive, politically sensitive, and third-party confidential information. 
Let's see confidentiality in corrosive FT cases. While transparency is enforced, there is a balance. Expert reports, witness statements, and factual exhibit or legal authorities are not disclosed. If a party disagrees with a protect information designation, they can apply to the tribunal within 21 days for a tribunal's decision. Procedural orders also allow for delayed broadcast of hearing, which can be posed if sensitive information is discussed. I believe that's also similar to the revised transparency rule. And these kinds of balance between confidentiality and transparency is maintained in Corus FTA cases. Next, transparency under Korean BITs. Most of Korean BITs don't mandate transparency in the same way the Corus FTA does. Instead, ISDS cases based on these BITs generally follow pre-2013 UNSTRA transparency rules, where tribunals often issue confidentiality orders at the request of investors. This typically prevents the disclosure of submissions, exhibits, and awards. However, in some cases, the award may be disclosed if both parties agree with sensitive information redacted. Let's see these differences between Coros FTA and Mauritius Convention. The Mauritius Convention, as you know, adopted in 2014, takes a broader approach to transparency. It retroactively applies the 2013 UNSTRA transparency rules to investment treaties agreed signed before April 1st, 2014, provided that the parties to those investment treaties agree. Unlike the Cruz FTA, the Mauritius Convention requires the public disclosure of broader categories, including expert reports and witness statements. But under the Mauritius Convention, tribunals also have the discretion to decide if exhibits and any other documents should be disclosed or not. Let's see potential concerns about the Mauritius Convention for Korea. Before we begin, I want to note that I cannot provide specifics on why Korea has not signed the Mauritius Convention yet, because it's a very complicated issue regarding uh, and involving multiple uh, ministries. However, I can speculate some reasons of this uh, Mauritius Convention. First, on the retro retroactive application, the Ma Mauritius Convention applies to investment treaties signed before 2014, as I said before, possibly requiring a review of around Korea's 100 BITs and FTAs to determine if reservations are necessary or not. As you, as you know, the EU uh, recently uh, joined to the Mauritius Convention, but there is a reservation, as Anna said. Uh, this could place a burden on the Korean government. And second, regarding the impact on defense strategies. Broader disclosure could hinder Korea's defense strategies by making detailed information publicly available, potentially misused for political purposes and political contention. Third, regarding the limitation on state discretion for confidentiality. Unlike the Korea's FTA, where confidentiality can be reviewed by a joint committee, which is comprised of contracting states, uh, aka Korea and United States. But the Mauritius Convention gives tribunal the final say on protected information. Fourth, regarding potential conflict with intent of domestic law. Domestic laws such as Korean Civil Procedure Act impose restrictions on court record publication. Although these domestic laws do not govern ISDS cases directly, the Mauritius Convention's broader disclosure requirements may conflict with the intent or notion of domestic regulations. Fifth, challenge in securing witnesses and experts. The requirement for public disclosure could discourage cooperation from witnesses and experts in especially sensitive cases. Conclusion. Transparency plays an essential role in fostering fairness, legitimacy, predictability in ISDS regime. While Korea may have valid concerns about adopting the Mauritius Convention, I believe that as the global momentum for transparency builds, 
there may be opportunities for Korea to reassess its approach regarding the Mauritius Convention in the near future. I will conclude my presentation here and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alex, for this uh, very comprehensive um, overview of uh, what is taking place in Korea in the, the cases under the uh, Chorus FTA and also what are the perspectives for Korea in, with regard to the Mauritius Convention. Thank you for that. Um, over to you, uh, Yoshimi, to look at the, uh, um, I, I might not say the experience, but maybe the, the approaches in, uh, in Japan over uh, the Mauritius Convention and transparency in general in ISDS. Over to you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. First, let me congratulate this wonderful, successful SO ADR event, as well as 10th you know, anniversary of Mauritius Convention. It is unfortunate that Japan hasn't signed and ratified Mauritius Japan. And I feel free to speak about my guests in terms of Japanese government position. So I, I think you know, I'm better, posi um, my position is better than Al Axel's, <laughs> Alex, excuse me. So first I'm gonna talk about um, what seemingly is the Japanese government position um, in terms of transparency rules in ISDS rules. And second, as um, Alex um, briefly mentioned, um, Japanese, the Korean culture, well, Korean domestic uh, practice in terms of transparency and dispute resolution in Korea, I also want to, you know, touch on the Japanese, um, you know, a sort of culture um, in terms of disclosure of dispute settlement proceedings in Japan. And lastly, uh, potential solution that could be more palatable, um, Asian countries such as Japan to accept a um, certain level of transparency, not probably as ambitious as the one set out in UNCITRO rules on transparency or Mauritius Convention. So firstly, what appears to be the government, Japanese government position is that, well, it, when it comes to Mauritius Convention, um, Japanese government hasn't decided yet whether to sign up the Mauritius Convention it's still an open question um, for them to decide whether to sign the Mauritius Convention. Second, looking at the treaties that Japanese government enter into, Japanese government have accepted certain level of transparency in IDSDS rules. Mm -hmm. Look at the, the best example is CPTPP. CPTPP follows the US model BIT, so it includes you know, broader transparency rules. So the disputing party shall disclose all documents, um, important documents listed in CPTPP. Of course, subject to elaborated uh, proceedings to reduct certain confidential information and general exceptions set out uh, um, disclosure information uh, which allow government to uh, limit the disclosure of some conf sensitive information in the proceedings. Just setting aside CPTPP, there are other treaties to which the Japanese parties, um, to which the Japanese, uh, Japanese government is a party to, and they do have certain level of transparency but there's a stark difference between those treaties, um, transparency rules and CPTPP transparency rules. Those treaties, uh, uh, BITs, um, that Japan entered into relatively recently, they do have a provision relating to disclosure of um, documents in the ISDS proceedings. The major difference is it's not a disputing party obligated to disclose but it is a disputing party's ability to disclose. So the, the treaty simply provides a disputing party may <laughs> disclose. So it's up to the disputing party, a state party, whether to disclose or not, which is a complete different uh, position from the one in UNCITRAL or Mauritius Convention. Then looking at the recent case, um, 
Alex introduced the, you know, PCA website showing how Korean government disclosed all the important submissions after proper reduction to the public. Um, Japan is reportedly, uh, Japan reportedly has the first um, ISDS case relatively recently, but as you all know, the information has been pretty much uh, under strict control. So um, the treaty, uh, underlining treaty, is the treaty that entered into pre-2014. Um, uh, so it's before the, you know, um, before the time unsidural rules on transparency uh, entered into force. But appeared to be that parties um, made a very strict confidentiality rule. So even if, you know, GAR cannot <laughs> divulge, um, you know, information on this, um, the very allegedly the very first um, case against Japan. It appears that, you know, the government position, Japanese government position is, of course, you know, transparency is such an important rule, but should be uh, more options for uh, a party, state party, because um, it, the disclosure could create some problem um, or could be taken advantage by the other state party. So it's not, the, the rule is not that simple as um, ISDS should be published, subject to limited um, exception, and such exception would be dictated by the tribunal decision. So perhaps, you know, lastly, um, the potential solution that could be more palatable to um, the state like Japan is give more option to the government um, as to the uh, as to the scope of disclosure or the timing of disclosure. One of the reasons why the Japanese government seems, uh, seems to be concerned about the disclosure of the alleged first case is the publication of this award could invite more cases against government. I don't know whether it is a legitimate concern or not, but government may wish to at least control the timing of uh, publication of certain documents. I miss one important point, which is the domestic culture. <laughs> Um, when there's a litigation in the United States, you can easily get submissions while the case is pending. Even I can check the website and get information, submission and evidence um, from the internet. But Japan, although the constitution provides the trial should be made public and judgment has to be made public, it's not really accessible um, the dispute settlement proceeding considered to be more private and delicate, contains sensitive information. So it's, it should be, you know, not, it's not that um, court proceedings or documents should be publicly available automatically. Um, you can go to the court and check the file and find the case, but it's not that you can make a copy of those decision or submissions um, under Japanese law. So, you know, when it comes to dispute um, internet investment treaty arbitration, if all the documents or submissions are forcefully made public, it's quite inconsistent with our practice. That might be not only in Japan, but could be the case in Korea as well as other Asian countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yoshimi, for this uh, very interesting analysis uh, going to the roots of, um, of this um, approach by the, by the Japanese government. So I'm, I'm giving over now to Arne uh, to tell us more about the recent move uh, of the uh, European Union. I'm sorry that I spilled the beans <laughs> ahead of your presentation uh, about uh, um, the, the joining of the Mauritius Convention by the European Union. Over to you. Thank you, Arne. Um, Look, the EU signature of the Mauritius Convention has been a long time in the making, and this does not only mark the 10th anniversary of the Convention, but indeed of the efforts at the EU level. And, um, shortly after um, the Convention came into existence, the Commission started the process, requested a mandate from the Council um, to exceed 
to the Mauritius Convention. Now, the Council, that is the EU body where the ministers of the different member states convene to decide on policy questions. And it then took 10 years for the Council to actually give that mandate and approve the accession of the European Union. And that gives you some insight, some idea of how complex the political landscape is and how different the views are within the member states. When we look at the Council decision and at the signature by the EU, there are two different implications that are important to highlight. Now, the first is the obvious one, and I already mentioned this. This paves the way for ratification of the Convention uh, and therefore application to disputes arising under treaties to which the EU itself is a contracting party. Now, the practical relevance of that is rather limited. Uh, there's only one treaty where the EU itself is a member, uh, that's the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, as for the reservation um, that was mentioned a couple times earlier, I know that that has given a rise to questions uh, around the world. Um, maybe to dispel that, the EU recorded that the Convention will not apply in disputes under the Energy Charter Treaty in which the EU is acting for a member state and that member state has not also ratified the convention. So this brings us deep into the technicalities of EU law, but what's most important to understand this reservation is that under EU law competencies for legislative and regulatory action are divided between the union and the member states. And very broadly speaking, there are three different categories that can be distinguished. Now, there's acts adopted by the member states in their exclusive competency, and if those acts give rise to um, investment claims, the member state acts as respondent, uh, the EU has no direct involvement, and whether the Mauritius Convention applies depends on ratification of the convention by that member state. Then there's acts of bodies and organs of the European Union. And if those were to give rise to ISDS claims, the European Union is the respondent um, and application of the convention is dependent on ratification by the European Union. The reservation is really irrelevant for those two categories. Uh, but there's a third category, and that's acts where the member states are adopting measures in implementation of EU law. So, for example, EU directives. And because the member state is the one who's formally acting, um, but the substance of the measure originates from the EU, and the member state is obliged under EU law to take that measure, um, EU law assigns liability for those uh, measures if ISDS claims arise to the union and it contemplates a possibility for the union to step in as respondent for the member states. So this is where the reservation is relevant by clarifying that the convention in those cases only applies if both the European Union and the member states have ratified the convention. And that ties back to the 10 years of political debate that I mentioned initially. Um, member states were very concerned that EU ratification could lead to application of the convention in cases in which they are implicated, even though they themselves did not ratify the convention. So this reservation, in a way, is a political compromise to protect the sovereignty of the member states and to get the necessary support in the Council to get the Commission that mandate to accede to the convention. The Second important implication, um, and arguably even more important, is that this clears the path for the member states themselves to ratify the convention. I said earlier there's only one case, only the Energy Charter Treaty that's relevant at the EU level. If we look at the member state level, that's vastly different. There's more than a thousand investment treaties um, that could potentially fall within the scope of the Mauritius Convention. And also in this regard, the complexities of the competency allocation and the political sensitivity um, came into play in the past decade. The competencies in clear in that the uh, Commission takes a view that 
it has exclusive competence over investment treaties and also over related instruments, such as uh, treaties uh, governing transparency in investment disputes, so the Mauritius, Con um, the Mauritius Convention. And therefore, any member state action requires authorization by the union for the member states um, to actually accede to this convention. And you may have seen, and um, Anna and Aurelia, I think, mentioned earlier too, that there were some states, for example, Germany, that signed the convention very quickly, but then never ratified it during the past 10 years. And this is one of the reasons why that is the case, right? You were missing that authorization. And the council decision that we finally got in June of this year, I believe, checks both marks. So first ratification, authorization for the EU to exceed, and then authorization also for the member states to follow suit once that ratification has been completed. And now, with those obstacles finally out of the way, the path is clear, and as Anna optimistically said, uh, for more states to join. Uh, whether that is the case, I'm not quite sure I share that optimism. I think that remains to be seen. Um, you know, from my experience working with states in investment arbitrations, uh, looking at the member states of the European Union in the abstract, all of them are big proponents of transparency. And they have very good arguments for that. Um, Aurelia mentioned this earlier, things tend to get a little bit different when you actually implicate it yourself. And it's about your case, um, and that is what the Mauritius Convention does. It makes it very real all of a sudden, right? And in that case, then, transparency also means increased scrutiny, increased political exposure of civil servants, of senior um, political decision makers. There are questions around potential uh, disruptive impact on the proceedings itself. Everybody acts different when they're in front of a camera. Uh, that's very simple, a very simple fact. It's the other side of the coin, if you so will, um, of the debate we had on our previous panel around um, confidentiality. Um, so it, these concerns have driven, to some extent, slow progress in the past decade. And I do think that uh, we're not quite there yet and that the discussions will continue and there's still some lobbying on behalf of transparency to be done to really get member states um, on board. And maybe one, one observation on what Yoshimi mentioned about the Japanese um, approach, um, the relevance of timing. That's also something that I have very much observed in practice. So, one life investment arbitration that we have where we're representing the state, we were unable to get consent from the deputy prime minister in charge to agree to full transparency, but we were able to get the consent to agree to full disclosure of materials after the award had been rendered. So that's certainly a, a first step, a good step, and shows the different considerations that may be at, at, at play here. Thank you very much, Arne, uh, for this um, overview of where we stand when, with regards to transparency, uh, one of the still hotly debated issues in, uh, in, in investment arbitration. And uh, what I take uh, out of this discussion is a, an illustration of uh, do as I say, not as I do. So with this, I'm giving over to uh, Hitek to walk us through third-party funding. Okay. Uh, given the time left, we may have to jump to the second theme, third-party funding. And um, this topic has gained increasing but diverse reactions from the international arbitration community, whether disclosure and enhanced transparency would be sufficient or uh, there got to be soft or hard regulation of those uh, third-party funding. This raises the question of how best to harmonize such regulations or such treatment to benefit all the stakeholders in Asia's ISDS landscape, including local service users and whether third-party funding providers might consider strategies uh, tailored to Asia's ADR market. My first question goes to Aurelia. Uh, could you share the process of building consensus among state parties 
in addressing the third party funding issue in the amendment to the exceed arbitration rules, as well as any observation from exceed experience since this amendment took effect. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm going to call third party funding TPF if you don't mind, that's way simpler for me. Uh, so we have a new uh, arbitration rules, arbitration rule 14, that also applies in the additional facility rules, and it requires both disputing party to file a, re a notice as soon as the request for arbitration is registered or immediately upon securing the TPF, and basically it's a disclosure obligation. Uh, the name and address of the funder and the persons owning or controlling the funder has to be disclosed, and they are called non-parties, and so the rule applies to any non-party from which a party, directly or indirectly, has received funds. Uh, that includes law firms, insurers, financial institutions, affiliates and NGOs. The funds can be a donation, a grant, remuneration in return, contingency fees, etc. If the non-party is a juridical person, the name of the person and entity that own and control the funder must be disclosed, and I will come back to that. So the purpose is a notice or disclosure obligation that is intended to be an avoidance of conflict provision. So when a tribunal is constituted, we ask the arbitrator whether they accept their appointment and we disclose those information and then the arbitrator can see whether there is actually a conflict of interest with one of the funders, for example, or, or any uh, entities uh, present. It's also interesting to, I mean, it, you should note that the tribunal may order the disclosure about the funding agreement, uh, but there is no obligation in the rules to provide the funding agreement. So under the 2020 rules, um, in 16% of all arbitration cases, there was a notification of a TPF. It's not new. Uh, we had under the 2006 rules already a lot of voluntary disclosure, um, but basically um, the 2020 rules picked up on the intention of some states. As far as Asian states are, are concerned, we are aware of one TPF in WM mining versus Mongolia under the 2006 rules. So the issue debated by our member states. First, there was a permissibility of TPF. Some wanted a complete prohibition of the TPF. Uh, some states uh, said no because that would preclude the use of dispute settlement for small and medium enterprise in the sense of access to justice. And so the consensus was to have some regulation focusing on transparency and avoiding conflict of interest. Second, the definition of the TPS was highly debated. TPF, sorry, was highly debated. Um, and so we had six working paper uh, from 2016 to 2022. And until the working paper five, basically the parties council were not covered by, by our rules because the name of the representatives are known up front and so the arbitrators would have known in advance. I mean, there was no, there was no doubt about that, but the, ch the states wanted it, so we changed it. Also note that pro bono services are not captured by what we say in the, in the funding so far. That was also discussed. Uh, third point, the scope of the disclosure that was highly debated. So there is a scope, you have to disclose the entities that own and control that funder. The two needs to be disclosed. This was highly debated that it goes to the ultimate ownership of the funder. And some states were very adamant about it. This requirement was introduced late in working paper six uh, at the insistence of member states. Also, some states wanted more disclosure, for example, the text of the funding, uh, but other states argue that there is a need to protect confidential business information contained in the agreement. Um, so it was not retained as an automatic disclosure, but again, the tribunal may order the disclosure of the funding agreement on a case-by-case -case basis. There was also a request to have an indication of the person with authority to settle the claim that was not retained. And finally, there were some states which were wondering whether the funder would be liable for any adverse cost decisions, right? And, but this raised an issue of jurisdiction of the tribunal over funder who had non-party to an exit case, so this was not retained. Again, some states were adamant that having heavy disclosures requirement was limiting justice for small and medium enterprise, access to justice. Uh, sanction, there is no sanction in Rule 14 about the non-disclosure. Um, 
you know, non-compliance with the rules. Some states requ requesting penalties, some states requ requested the suspension and the termination of the cases. Some others say that it could be dealt with in a decision on cost, and that's what finally uh, has been decided. So under Rule 52 on costs, the tribunal considers the conduct of the parties, and that includes whether they comply with the rules as a factor in allocating the cost, right? Uh, last point, the relationship of TPF with security for cost. So it used to be that security for costs were requested under provisional measures, but by now they have their own arbitration rule. Um, and um, in, the, in the circumstances that tribunal uh, can take into account, uh, the question was whether TPF was a circumstances by itself. So as soon as you have a TPF, you can get a security for cost, or is it one of the many circumstances that a tribunal need to consider? And, um, the, and basically we decided, and the states decided, that the mere, mere existence of a TPF does not justify a security for cost. The tribunal needs to apply the test as designed in the rule, because the reason is that the point of the security for cost is the likelihood of not satisfying an award on cost, right? It's not because you have a TPF that the claimant is in pecunious. That was our position. Um, and so the existence of a TPF does not necessarily signal the situation of the impecunious claimant, and it can just be a means of allocating corporate resources and risks. Um, this is in line with previous cases. This is different from what the working group has in mind, um, as first, the funding agreement will be disclosed, and second, the tribunal will, will take uh, the existence of the TPF as one of the circumstances uh, to, uh, um, provide, to uh, order a security for cost. That was in short our situation with the TPF. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, really, this presentation uh, indicates that the wide range of issues and complication. And so uh, uh, I am very, in a sense, pleasant surprise that uh, exceed uh, amendment process, uh, they can reach a consensus, uh, maybe as a first step, uh, but uh, it was a remarkable achievement uh, in uh, reaching an amendment uh, to, with that con contents. And Arnie, uh, could you provide insights on TPF regulation in Europe in a very concise manner? And are there EU-wide rules on TPF, or is this issue left to individual member states? Yeah. Look, if you look at the past two decades, um, third-party funding has undergone massive transformation in Europe. Um, back in 2000, um, TPF was maybe established in England, in continental Europe was barely present, um, whereas today, um, it is a very active scene. You have all of the major funders operating in Europe with ever-growing teams, very professional. Um, it, you will see them at every arbitration conference. So it, it's very much an established element of the dispute resolution process today. Um, from my experience as counsel, if you ask me just to very simply um, put a label on this. I think the pros have by far outweighed the cons of this. Yeah? Um, the single most important result has been that uh, SMEs and even individuals have gotten to pursue claims that they would otherwise have been unable to. Um, so a very positive impact on access to justice. Um, you know, what Olea mentioned earlier, the element of third-party funding potentially being a means to um, manage cash flow and risk management. Um, that may be true. I've explored that with a couple of clients. Um, but in the end, all clients who were able uh, to fund the case themselves decided to do so because the commercial setup simply didn't add up for them if those are the main drivers. And well, uh, importantly, and this was one of the big concerns, um, the presence of TPF did not open the floodgates to frivolous claims. And I think uh, that's a simple consequence of logic. It's the business model of third-party funders to make money with claims in which they are successful. So they undergo a very thorough due diligence process, and in fact, it is probably even more a sign of quality if you get funding for a claim um, than that it allows frivolous claims. 
Um, the one caveat that I would put on it is that it is imperative to have clear regulation. Yeah, um, that applies with regard to the implications on the arbitration, disclosure requirements, costs, everything that Aurelia mentioned, and with regard to the general regulatory framework. Um, if you look at Europe, the regulatory framework is fragmented. Um, there's not a single um, harmonized set of rules, and even within the different jurisdictions, there's no express rules. Yeah, there's general consensus that third-party funding is permissible, um, but the rules that have implications on what you can do and what are the potential limits, they follow from various different instruments. Yeah? So many times this will be the rules of professional conduct for lawyers, um, banking and finance regulations, or general rules under uh, civil law, and the, the civil procedure code, or even uh, just uh, the regular civil code. Um, Two very brief uh, practical examples, or maybe even just one on the ladder in the interest of time. Um, you know, I was sitting as arbitrator in one case uh, where the funded party thought to recover um, the fees of the funder after the dispute was resolved, um, arguing that the percentage of recovery um, was exceeding the limits of what's permissible under the applicable law. And indeed, if you look at the applicable law, uh, there's questions. Yeah, that's, there's no single set of regulations that says you know, more than 50% is not possible. So you see how disputes in practice very much arise from the absence of clear regulation. And I think if we look at Asia and if we have more um, states contemplating funding here, that would be my main plea and to ensure that you provide for clear rules, not just in the institutional setting, so everything that ICSID is doing, but also as a state, um, providing clear guidance to avoid such disputes and reap the benefits. Thank you very much. Uh, David, uh, could you uh, update us on the current status of TPF in Korea? I hear some conflicting opinions on whether it is permitted under Korean law and any possibility of regulatory clarity on this issue. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Shin. Um, it's perhaps fitting that Arnie left with the, the last statement about um, clarity in regulations being you know, the, of the utmost importance. And um, unfortunately, Korea does not have any express regulations or legislation that either expressly allows for or prohibits the use of third-party funding. And so it very much does exist in a gray area. Um, there are legislation on the books and have been on the books for quite some time that some scholars and some in, in the legal field look to see that restricts the use of third party funding. And so to give some context, we know that our, our neighbors north and south of Korea in terms of Singapore and Hong Kong and most recently China, but perhaps that's a bit of a, um, an outlier, but both Singapore and Hong Kong, um, having come from common law jurisdictions, have the the legal doctrine of champerty <clears throat> and maintenance, uh, which doesn't really exist in Korea. And so because of that, we, we've never really had, for example, in Hong Kong and Singapore in 2017, having to amend their laws to allow a carve out of international arbitration. Whereas, as we all know, uh, still in co the local courts, local litigation in both Singapore and Hong Kong um, are still, that's still prohibited. In Korea, there is that gray area. The, the one law that, that many scholars sort of refer to and all Korean lawyers would know is Article 34.5 of the Attorney at Law Act, which essentially says that no fees or profits or any benefits earned um, through services that are provided by attorney at law can be shared with um, a non-lawyer. And so some scholars have looked at that to say that if a third party funder is involved and, and the benefits such as the fees or, or the profits of any case are shared, then that would be in violation of this article. Now, in recent years, uh, scholars have taken the view that, that this, this is not as limiting as some might think. You can, if, if the third party funder just um, enters an agreement directly with the client and there's no involvement with the lawyer, then you could, that is sort of one way to, to get around that. Now, I think where we are today is um, perhaps 
the best way I would put it is if you look at the case AB today and, and just, just Korea generally, um, very much a wait and see approach because you'd rather do something correct rather than follow the others and see how it, how it pans out, especially given the long history of, of, of the, these laws being on the books. And so a perfect example of that would be expedited rules, for example. The HKIC started it in 2008 and then uh, SEAC joined shortly thereafter, but it took the KCAB till 2016 to decide that this was right to include. And if you follow that sort of timeline with that of these introduction of the disclosure requirements for third party funding, then I, I, I hope, and this is my personal opinion, that it's just a matter of time that the KCAB will include it. But uh, I, I can say on good authority that they are considering it uh, during this recent revisions to the, to the rules. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Yoshimi, uh, what's the situation in Japan? Yes, um, I'm mindful of time, so just quickly. The situation is um, similar to Korea and Germany uh, in a sense that there's no clear law or regulations that prohibit third party funding, unlike you know, common law jurisdiction, which has laws of charity. Um, but just like Korea, um, Attorneys Act, um, some of the provisions in Attorneys Act to be considered uh, could be um, violated depending on the structure of the third party funding. For example, um, under Article 73, no one can run a business of acquiring rights of third parties for the purpose of enforcing those rights by way of litigation or mediation or otherwise. So if third party funders acquire the rights um, claims um, against states, for example, and pursue enforcing those claims against states that would be in breach of this attorney act. And the consequence is serious. Um, if it is found to be breach of this provision, then um, the contract is void and subject to criminal penalties. So there should be some clarity um, as, to the f um, as to the third party funding business because there are certain demands in Japanese market for third party funding. Most notable example is um, some th very well known um, third party funding came to Japan and solicited um, um, you know, funding opportunity uh, targeting um, the Credit Suisse, Credit Suisse um, 81 bondholders. So they, you know, put a sort of, ad, not really advertisement, but um, approach uh, Nikkei newspaper. And Nikkei newspaper is one of the most, um, you know, um, popular um, business newspapers. And there was a kind of, not yet advertisement, but uh, there is uh, information there soliciting, you know, in bondholders. Um, and that was in conjunction with the effort of Singapore lawyers, interestingly. <laughs> so Singapore lawyers and third party funder got together, came to Japan and solicited bondholders, 81 bondholders. And some have, you know, seized that opportunity and this demonstrate the fact that third party funding is quite important. Um, to achieve the access to justice. And what about the uh, prospect of clarity in this area of law uh, in the near future? Um, court decision, um, there are interesting court decisions limiting the interpretation or application of um, Attorneys Act, um, like Article 73, for example, when um, a UK company acquired a right, uh, acquired a sovereign bond and enforced that bond in the Japanese court and um, the sovereign bond, um, the sovereign um, claim not only immunity but also this breach of Article 73 and that allegation was denied. So the court will come in and limit the interpretation of Attorneys Act but it could be not it could it may not be enough uh, to give clarity uh, in this area and hope um, that you know uh, lawyers will work together to come up with to propose uh, clear rules and regulations in this field in the near future thank you maybe in this kind of very conservative uh, jurisdictions which have the legacy of old <laughs> style uh, 
almost archaic legislation regulating attorneys' uh, fees or the third-party funding, uh, maybe international arbitration community should raise somewhat louder voices uh, to have our politicians or lawmakers to listen to this new demand in the market uh, so that uh, effective and fair support could be given to those who are uh, lacking sufficient uh, resources to bring cases uh, to have better justice in the system. As uh, our time is up, uh, we may have to conclude our session uh, at this stage. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all our speakers for their valuable insights. I hope today's session has provided a comprehensive over overview of ISDS reform as it stands now, and transparency and TPF particularly within the Asian context. And thank you for all uh, your keen attention. And I hope you enjoy the autumn ambience of Seoul. And we look forward to seeing you here again next year, this time. Thank you very much. So that that brings us to the end of session four of the 13th Asia-Pacific ADR conference. We would like to sincerely thank our exceptional moderators as well as all of our speakers and the audience as well. Thanks to their extensive expertise and insight, we had, uh, we had yet another round of constructive discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them another round of big applause. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, that officially concludes the 13th Asia-Pacific ADR conference titled ADR Reborn, Dynamics of Renewed Asian ADR Landscape. We would like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to all of our highly esteemed speakers and moderators for sharing their expertise with us today. In addition, we would like to sincerely thank all of our participants, both online and offline, for staying with us until the very end of our our programs today. If you're joining us today here in Seoul, have a great evening. And if you're joining us from other parts of the world, have a great day ahead. This has been Hemi Kim. Thank you very much. <laughs>